Okay, Dean Rusk disagrees with you, and he was the Secretary of State at the time, but that's fine. The communist nations have exploited the turmoil of a time of transition in an effort to extend the communist control into other areas of the world. His thoughts on Dean Rusk and America's involvement in Vietnam, I know next to nothing about that. Exactly. Finished the book about the assassination of uh, Archduke Ferdinand. My principe, which kicks off World War I. My interest in this came because I like a left-wing podcast. I listen to a lot of podcasts, most of them admittedly are right-wing, uh, but I also listen to a lot of things that I don't agree with. So, this is an... It's a anti-fascist podcast, but not in the modern sense. It's a history of uh, fascist movements, is, is a lot of what it is. The name of the podcast is called The Empire Never Died. So, they caught my attention when uh, I was looking for actual reviews of this book, where if you were in my circles of the internet, there would be maniacs, and the big joke was to get on air and scream really loudly, Raid Siege! Raid Siege! scream this that's it those three cents those two words three cents those two words they would just scream that really loudly and this was supposed to be like hey this is a fascist book we're screaming for you to read it and it's gonna save the planet or like it's gonna have any anything and lightning going on in there and so i read it and i reviewed it and you can see my review of it so i was looking for another review and i came up uh, upon a review by somebody else on the turner diaries which I'd also read in my little circle of right-wing fanatic books. So uh, I read that. I say uh, for the Turner Diaries, it's very simple. It starts off okay, they're taking the guns, we gotta organize, and then it just goes off in the Never Never Land. And, uh, he's, he's, he's invading Russia, he's breaking out of prison, it gets nuts. And he actually comes to fault with what great writers had to do with, not that this person is a great writer, uh, but one of the Russian greats, Dostoevsky. So Dostoevsky, in some of his books falls to this problem, which is that he's being paid by the week or by the month to publish these periodicals. And so that's why some of these stories seem to just go on in, a, in weird circles. They don't seem to tie up well. It's like a bad season of The Sopranos, where you're like, I don't know whatever happened to that Russian guy in the forest. And they go, yo, neither do I. I think they were gonna write in where like they kind of see him across the street and they just panic and then he's not there anymore. But uh, yeah, it just doesn't really go anywhere. I mean, that character, that guy, you just never, he's in the show, he's a Russian, they, they, they owe money, they beat the fuck out, they're trying to bury him, turns out he's special forces and he's taken off in the woods even after being shot. Okay, good episode, because you got the two guys from Jersey who have to chew gum and one guy's been holding out and they're freezing and they don't know how to handle the woods, so, okay. I'm not saying it's a bad episode, but like, it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't, it doesn't tie off into anything. There's no beginning, middle, or end, it's just a random character that comes into the show and then leaves, you never see him again. Kind of like The Room. The Room, the famous terrible movie, The Room, which they did a movie about, which I never saw the movie. The movie about the movie. I saw the original movie. I didn't read the book either. But the original... The original book introduces, like, a character. And it says a sentence, and you're like, okay, I'm going to follow along with the story, and you never see them again. <laughs> Always be very mindful. If you see a movie that Mr. DeMeo from, uh... That... Terrible, terrible show called Gravesend. Oh, that is so bad. Anyway, I don't know how that's being made, but that's for another episode. Uh, if you're the writer, the producer, the director, the main actor, and the singer, usually it's going to be shit. That's just, it's a general rule. So it has a tendency for things to go on. Not remembering a point, which is almost what I did there. The Turner Diaries reads like a periodical. And it gets kind of insane and off the rails. I gotta admit, in the beginning, I was all with them. They come to take your guns. They come to, it starts off with, uh, there's another arrest by either the federal police or the local cops. And it's a group of guys who've, you know, been hiding guns in the wall and uh, all private ownership of firearms has become illegal. And this is the beginning of the crackdown by the government against the people. And some people are resisting and they form little groups and associations. And then apparently the Jews are the problem, and uh, the blacks. And then at some point he's invading Russia, which is just not... Just, you, <laughs> you could have had a, a little bit of a diehard hero 
who's, you know, fighting the government or whatever he's doing, but you became ridiculous. And you're a bad writer. I I even read the guy's second book, Hunter, which again, he's, he's out there. Who is he killing? He's killing. There's a creep out there who's killing interracial couples. And he finally gets caught by a Fed. And the Fed turns out that he's on his side. And the Fed enlightens him that the real enemy is the Jews, not these interracial couples. And I'm like, yeah, you haven't really convinced me that any of them are. Like, I'm reading this to get into how you think. And you realize it's not written for people to be convinced of anything. It's a fantasy book for people who are already there. It's not an ideology book. It's a fantasy, revenge, kill him up, shoot him up. It takes no time to convince you of any point. At no point is there a fascist, racist statement or point being made. It's not like Ayn Rand, where there's like 65 pages of John Galt's speech, or Francisco Danconia's money speech, or um, where Ellsworth Tui is yelling at the, the stupid son of the, the fucking train company, what I like to call the statist, a speech that nobody really pays attention to. It goes to the heart of what statism is, where he reveals to him who he truly is, that he's lowered all standards on purpose, he's raised up um, incompetence at the, at the expense of brilliance on purpose, that he's in, he's in all the journals, and that he has no real point. It's almost like a, a conversation with Satan himself. It's not that. I know he thinks there is. Like when this killer is in the room with the FBI agent, he's like, no, it's the Jews. It's not, an, it's, I, he could try to make an argument. It's in the, anyway. So I read Hunter. I read the Turner Diaries. And of course, I actually, in reality, read Siege by James Mason. And you can see my reviews elsewhere. But uh, as opposed to all the people, all these spaz, spazzes who are online screaming, read Siege. And you can tell that these people probably didn't read, haven't read a book in a, any book. <laughs> and I don't think they, they would finish a book. Anything, even if even if it was that, even if it was Siege by James Mason, a lot of it is like the history of the seventies, and like he was literally thrown out of the right wing radical movements for being too radical, apparently, because he always, you know, he admired action, wanted more action. It's a whole. I did the review, so the only other review of this book that I could find, there was a guy who did the Turner Diaries, and then he did like a uh, another character, I believe, a real life character, and it was disingenuous. And there's a lot wrong about that guy, but it was it was disingenuous. I could have done a better job. So then I found another review of James Mason. And it seemed to be like there were a couple of parts to this. There was I think the James Mason there was like one on James Mason and one on Siege. And it talked about a lot about the, who these people were in that circle. There's a lot of like pedophiles. There's a lot of weirdos. And if you actually read Siege, you'll see it's in the book. There's like one Italian guy, he's called the Tomato Fascist, which is strange for a bunch of guys who do not like Italians. Uh, you, you, you learn from these speeches and these people. I've, I've also got a bunch of speeches by this author. And I'm, though, this is where he's trying to convince me. And the, uh, at the same time is saying that he's not a person of Christ. And please do not misunderstand me. I'm not talking about uh, the wages of sin in the sense with which many of us may be familiar. I'm not talking about some anthropomorphic deity, some heavenly father sitting on his throne in the sky and punishing us keeping us from overcoming our enemies because we are not fulfilling his commandments. No, that's nonsense. We're not being punished by any supernatural being. He makes a commitment to climate change. And there are, in fact, several issues on which we are closer to what would ordinarily be considered the left-wing or liberal position than we are to the conservative or right-wing position. One of these issues is the ecology issue. The protection of our natural environment, the elimination of pollution, the protection of wildlife. And there are also other issues where we are closer to the liberals than to the conservatives. Although I doubt that we agree with them completely on any issue, just as we seldom, if ever, agree completely with the right wing on any issue. Which we all know is a socialist scam, and uh, he has such a religious zeal for his movement and that we should really commit ourselves to it. And he's not necessarily religious, not even the following Christ. It's his own thing, and never says why. He just gets, it's all excited, this great speech that we all need to be committed. It never goes to the why. I'm like, I, there's like 35 more speeches of the guy, the author of the Turner Diaries, used the pen name, but his real name. So I have those speeches. So I find this review, and um, it's a great channel. Uh, the channel is uh, The Empire Never Died. 
Even if you're a conservative, if you're a Republican, if you're a Trump voter, if you're a Biden voter, if you're a Bernie Sanders voter, if you like Jimmy Dore, if you like the Young Turks, you like anarchism, you like anarchists, you're a, uh, what do they call them, incrementalist, uh, if you're a statist, if you're with Antifa, if you're with the Proud Boys, um, if you're an accelerationist, if you're a communist, if you're a Marxist, if you're a tanky, uh, th this is a fantastic channel with very informative, uh, detailed background about specific characters in a lot of fascist movements, mostly fascist movements. So it's a review. Now, obviously, it's slanted and it's told by a bunch of Antifa people, but it's very, and I'm not one, and I don't like that, and I hate them, and they're disgusting, and sh Uh, but... And yes, yes, they're a real organization. Um, yes, they're effective. I don't know why, every time, every time you, you mention Antifa, there's a jerk-off going like, It's not a real thing! I don't know why you all have the same arguments. It certainly is a real thing, and it has a command structure. There's, like, people and generals and sorry, it's a, I don't know why you think it doesn't. Of course it does. Yes, there's meeting group. It's not this, this homogenous, you know, hey, we're all going to protest the uh, rulers of Iraq, and we're going to stand in, in the square, and we're just going to be spontaneous revolution of the young, and it's just happening and spreading through message. It's, it's not that. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's obviously very strong. Ah, these people don't go to jail. It's it's like, it's political anyway. So every time you mention it, there has to be one jerk off telling you that it doesn't exist, that it's an idea. The reason why they tell you that, and you'll see my review of Antifa as an idea, it was a writer into the Wall Street Journal, it was a comic that he wrote to the paper, and he basically wrote what these people are doing, and of course, they're all partisan hacks. They know that it's a thing, it's a real thing, and that it's dangerous. They know exactly what it is. The line is that it's an idea, it's the thing of the people. Your grandfathers were anti-fascists. Yeah, I don't think my grandparents were running around beating up cops and burning down cities and making out as a political protest. I just, I, somehow, I don't think that guy in 43 <laughs> was, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, they were fighting Nazis. But, you know, when you beat people up for having a political opinion, that's like a beer hole putsch, which was the fascist way that Hitler came to power. And you just, he was the loudest guy at these beer halls in Germany, and he would be the most violent. It's in Mein Kampf. Just, he was the most violent. There's not a lot about Jews, actually, in Mein Kampf. There's more about, he's very open about his addiction to power. He's very open about, like, not believing in a parliamentary system and voting. He's very open about his fascism, about his control. He doesn't say nice thing about Jews, but people who haven't read the material don't know what it is. Now, you don't have to be in defense of the material to read it. You have to know what it is. I don't understand how you don't read one of the most important books in the world because you think it's, A, going to polarize you and send you off to go, it's going to change who you are, <laughs> it's going to convince you, or that that's for nobody. You should read everything. You should read the Communist Manifesto, which I have done. You should read the Bible, Revelations, which I've done. You should read the Quran, which I've read. No, I have not read. <laughs> I've tried to a couple of times. I got very early on in the beginning. A lot of religious books have religious wars in them, and they get to calling their enemies somewhere in the book. You know, they kind of slip it in. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the Quran, it's like on page nine. It's like, and the infidels! Wow, oh, that was, that was, is this going to be the rest? Just, ah, oh, that was really fast. I did not expect that this quickly. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know some hadiths, and I uh, <laughs> know how to say uh, stop, don't shoot, <laughs> stop or I'll shoot in Arabic, classic Arabic. But um, I should read the Quran one day I will. So, you should read left-wing propaganda, right-wing propaganda. You should read everything, really. And you, who knows? You might find it entertaining. And you might find similarities between the two. <sighs> who knows? Um, you might find just uh, studies on nature of mass movements. Whatever political movement you're in, uh, understand that there's some part of you that's drawn to that for a need of belonging and familiarity. So, some people just need that belonging and they find it elsewhere. Sometimes that's all it is. I'm not saying that, that everything's fake or that nothing's real. It's just you have to you have to have a wider scope of things. So I love this podcast. This uh, 
the empire never died. I'm actually, I believe, yeah, no, I'm, I'm a paid patron, so I get to see stuff because they would, they're smart about how they put things out. They, I don't know how, they're really undervalued. Um, they, they put up like a preview and then they put up like a part two of something. So you're like, where the fuck is part one? And sometimes they'll never put up part one. They're very stingy. They, they just won't put it up. I don't know if they're scared of YouTube or they don't want it out there or they're smart to keep it behind, they just keep it behind a paywall. So you have to get to the paywall to get it's like, where's part one? If you never put out, if they should never actually put out part one. I know eventually they do. They just take their time. I think after they've milked however much money they can get from behind the paywall, they'll just put it up on YouTube. They, I've never seen them actually just not put up a part one of a series, which they should totally do in a business sense. If you find an interesting, a very interesting topic, maybe it has it's three part or six part and you just leave out certain parts forever. And no matter how many people are looking for it, you just go, I'm sorry, you gotta pay the dollar or the five dollars a month to see it. You have to. So they had this series and it was on um, Serbian nationalism. And, you know, the more I clicked around, the more I realized that these were like, it wasn't a, it wasn't a multi-part series, but there were different shows that kind of were related to the topic. And so I, I actually had a Serbian roommate at one point, and yes, he was a severe nationalist. To these people, Bosnia is a real thing. Like Yugoslavia, the, this shit like comes up in elections. No joke. It's crazy. Like I know none of us give a fuck. This shit comes up. So it's rare for me to have like an, a, a conversation with somebody who you don't usually hear of. Usually you'll hear about Slobodan Milosevic, about those wars and about how they were murdering Muslims and how Clinton came in and tried to save everybody. Of course, I have the book by Jean Kirkpatrick, who lamented uh, Bill Clinton and his policies there, and I haven't read it yet, but I'm going to do that. So there's a series of these episodes about Serbian nationalists, right-wing Serbian nationalists. Totally seeable, although, side note, according to my friend, uh, that country is run by the intelligence agencies. There's competing intelligence agencies, some from former socialist era-ish kind of, it's a weird place. Um, it's a very strange place. Although they do have some great booze. If you ever go there, get yourself some plum brandy. It's not called, uh, I forget what it's called. It's plum brandy. If you just ask for the plum brandy, it's good the stuff that's made in somebody's bathtub. Not the stuff from the store. You could buy some of this. You can buy plum brandy in the store. That's kind of what the Serbians have, but it's not that you're going to get more drunk. It's a different kind of drunk, which is very strange. It's not that you are more. It's not that you're more drunk by drinking this thing because it's so powerful. It's not like Absolute, where it's a more pure alcohol that gets you drunker faster. It is a different kind of drink. It is a different kind of drunk. Yo oh, yeah. Now, if you get a hold of it. Don't think because you're an American you're going to do shots. You don't do shots. You sip, have some food, relax, and then sip, okay? You shouldn't be able to finish a shot with. Okay. You know what? You do what you want. Enjoy. <laughs> it's the, see, with regular alcohol, there's people lying in the street. <laughs> with this, there's people walking backwards. Just... <laughs> something else so um there's not a lot really uh defending uh other than if you go to World War I and you look at Principe who fired the first shot at the Archduke Ferdinand uh you don't see a lot of pro-Serbian nationalist material or conservative anyway you could probably see right-wing nationalist crap but you won't see anything that sounds anything sane not that I can see like if you type in Sarajevo you type in anything about the Bosnian Wars, you're going to get one side of that conflict. There is no altering opinion. It's the son of somebody who suffered at the hands of the genocidists who were just uh, murdering Muslims. You're not going to get... There's no, there's no general, there's no politician who has written a published work. There's like one thing about nationalism out there, which costs 94 bucks. And it's probably the, the same. It's a detailed, more detailed of what you're looking for if you want to get into the politics of it. There's nothing from the other team. Like, uh, you know, when they say history is written by the victors, that definitely happened. Here. Like, after NATO and the UN and everybody, well, I don't know if NATO, the UN was over there. Like, there's not, you're not going to find any writings <laughs> of anything sane from that side. Anyway, so 
I found it interesting, and this all, of course, starts with Serbia, which kicks off World War I, when the Serbs, basically the Serbs, start World War I by killing one man, and that just drives the world into World War I. So I read a couple of books on World War I, which, of course, eventually leads, because of the unresolved issues, at the end of World War I leads to World War II. Two major world wars basically are started by this one shot heard around the world. So, I, there's a couple of movies out there. There's one Bosnian film, which is actually very good. I've watched um, something called uh, The White Guard, which is written about the competing different guards in, in Ukraine when it came to the Russians during the Russian Revolution. Uh, the, I guess the, the White Guard was not Bolshevik, and it was not, if I remember correctly, it was not Bolshevik, and it was Ukrainian. It was the old Ukrainian order. And there's a lot of politics. There's even love interests in this thing. I was going to read the book, but there was like only one. I didn't like a lot of audiobooks. I cheat. There was like one only audiobook, and it was kind of, I think it was, I think it was abridged, and it was free somewhere because somebody had finally put it to print. And uh, I realized there's no way that I could read the fucking. I'm not going to read that. That's way above my the old Russian literature. You know, fucking crime and punishment. I thought was fucking overrated. I think the one character that matters is the murderer. I don't want to give it away, but like that's the only. This is the only person that matters. His guilt is the only thing that matters. Uh, his his self indulgence, his arrogance, this fucking angry student, bullshit nonsense. It's the only thing that matters, and everything behind it. Like I said, these Russian writers sometimes they're paid by the week, by the month. So these stories just meander, and I don't understand what the greatness of it. Crime and punishment was not as interesting as it was. Did not deliver up to the promise and the hype. Uh, it's, it's kind of like staring at one of these paintings that looks like shit, but it's written by a great artist, so everybody's supposed to stand around and go, oh, that's great, modern art is shit, it's dog shit. It's a three-year-old can do that. You put multiple fucking paintings, just grab some cans of paint, throw them away. It's not art. It's not art. You're the joke. You're the piece of art. If you're staring at that and you think that's art, you're the joke, you get it? This guy knew that you're a jerk-off. He knew that. It's making fun of the art world. People like you. It's dog shit. Get a painting of a, I don't know. I have out there, uh, the Battle of Bella Wood. The famous one when Marine is fucking stabbing some hun in the fucking neck on the mountain. That's what I got. I have a uh, Washington crossing to Delaware. I have that over there. That's a pain, okay? <sighs> so, that Russian guy is fucking overrated. The Turner Diaries are fucking overrated. James Mason is ridiculous. And The Siege is ridiculous. And yes, you should read it. Go ahead. You'll get a nice view of the uh, 70s fascio scene, which is uh, interesting, I guess, if you care. He does make some interesting points about it. You know, people who have accused the fascists of being like Marxists, eh, he basically says yes. You know, so he doesn't care if the communists are fighting the cops, because to him, the cops and the state is his real enemy, or the Jews behind that. But the state is his bigger enemy than the blacks or the communists. So when he saw communist groups fighting the cops, he liked that kind of thing. Because, yeah, go get the pigs. That's his thing. Okay? That's who this guy is. All right. Nice fella. You don't have to be a, a, you know, a statist to understand that a guy who is rejoicing at the deaths of cops is not a nice person. Or a good person. Or someone who believes in law and order. Wait, he's going to run law and order? <laughs> it's just somebody who's skewed. So they have all this, uh, these episodes on Serbian fascism. So it starts me off in World War I. I actually read a World War I war book. No, I did the, the podcast, the famous one, by Carlin. Dan Carlin does a great podcast. You should listen to it about World War I. It's called um, uh, Blueprint for Armageddon. If you haven't listened to it, you should. He's also very smart. He, they used to be free. If you look around, you can find them in places. But uh, you can find all five episodes from 50 to 55 online in different places. If you want to ask me where they are, I can tell you. <laughs> but uh, they, uh, it's a very good World War One book. You learn that like 
World War One as opposed to World War Two stays in one area. So there's just this piles of bodies and shit and entrails and there's shelling and it's just uh, it, it it takes a look back on, on the amount of suffering that humans are capable of and when you read something like this about just the, the amount of death and and despair that that happened in World War one while these people were fighting each other and you wonder how could they how could they stand it And the truth is, it's a commentary on who they are, what they were defending. If you want to know who your soldier is, look behind them. Look at what he's defending. These people going to, you know, the horse track racing and, you know, the going to whatever shows that they were and Christmas and things that made them who they were, that they were willing to die for. Both sides. These, these were traditions and values and an upbringing, and a lifestyle, and a way of living, and a way of being that they wanted to continue, that they that they thought was worth dying for. That's how they were able to take such trauma, physically, mentally, morally, and spiritually, just an, an insane amount of death. Uh, take Band of Brothers and times that, the opening scene when you're hitting the beach, and times that by years, and times that, uh, just pretend you're in Band of Brothers and you're stuck on the beach for the whole war. There's not an invasion where you get over D-Day and you get into Germany. You're fucking, uh, it's D-Day every day. You're, people are going left and right quick, quick. They're talking to you one second, they're gone the next. Quickly. <laughs> and a lot of them are all fucked up. People you know, <laughs> people you met in the military, or people you know from the neighborhood, or a guy from the, your same city, your fellow patriot. You're like, oh, we like the same baseball team. That's enough to fucking be annoyed about when his head gets blown off. So, I did that podcast uh, on World War One, and uh, I have a bunch of books lined up for for World War One, uh, battle books, the Marines, of course, at Bellwood. Uh, I read. And um, there's a book called 1913, which is really what I'm interested in. The world before this assassination that kicks off. Whew, a ton of fucking death. Um, but right now, there's this book, and I'm trying, of course, to find the... Because every all, all movies, the, the three or four that are in English, about Princip, the assassin, they're all kind of praise. And even the Bosnian film I saw, I realized he is the hero. I was trying to... Uh, you know, watch it from the eyes of the, of the investigators, of the uh, police forces, but they're all portrayed as brutal thugs addicted to uh, a king class that probably shouldn't exist. And the highlight of the movie is the lawyer pointing out that by law, they have a right to secede. I am a Možda čak i absurdno, ali je ipak nepobitan fakt. Naime, ja tvrdim da potkvat koji je uperen na to da se Bosna i Hercegovina otrgne od austro-ugarske monarhije, kako to optužnica inkriminira, po našem zakonu, ne samo da nije čim je lizdaje, nego uopće nije nikako kažnjivo djelo. Berlinskim ugovorom iz 1878. Austro-Ugarska okupira Bosnu i Hercegovinu. Proklamacijom 1908. Bosna je anektirana. No unatoč tome, po pravnom shvaćanju, ipak ovim aktom nije Bosna utjelovljena državi Austro-Ugarskoj, jer još uvijek nije usledila privola legislative o baju dijelova monarhije. Do duše podnesene su zakonske osnove u Peštanskom i Bečkom saboru, ali one ni do danas nisu usvojene. Prema tome, odnošaj Bosne i Hercegovine prema Austro-Ugarskoj monarhiji su faktične naravi, ali ne i pravne. One uživaju zaštitu sile, ali ne i zaštitu zakona. To jest, aneksija je nezakonito stanje. Ja na ovom mišljenju nisam sam, na ovome stoji bečki profesor dr. Finger. Dakle, ne možete konstruirati optužbu za vele izdaju na rušenju aneksijonog stanja, jer je ono nezakonito stanje. Eventualna osuda koja bi uvažila ovu optužbu po članu 112 nikako se ne bi temeljala na zakonu, nego na silu. I time bi predstavljala samo uništenje Austro-Ugarske kao pravne države. There's one guy who's got a kid and we're all supposed to care that he's 
supposed to lie and say that he was threatened to do it to save his kid, but he's an adult, so he gets the death sentence. Meanwhile, the actual assassin. So it's also an amazingly funny story. They throw a bomb into the carriage, right? And it doesn't end up killing the uh, prince and his wife. And so the kind of the assassination group scatters, and one guy, Principe, goes to a local bar. He's like, I don't know what else to do. He goes to a bar or a cafe, and the carriage pulls up because of either a busted tire or because of the grenade attack that happened a couple of minutes ago. It kind of pulls up, rolls up right in front of him, and they're, like, fixing the carriage. And he's like, this is lucky fucking dude. Bang! So I finished this book. And I only finished this book just because I want to listen to this podcast. But I want to be well-read before I show up and start hearing about Serbian, Serbian nationalism. I want to know something about World War I. I want to know about Serbia. I want to know about Kosovo. I want to know Sarajevo. Before I even turn on this left wing, it's just that before I, before I even do that, I'm going to do just, just the basics. you got to do the basics, okay? So we'll do some of the basics. And that's what I'm doing. That's what I've been doing with my time. They're giving me the red light. It's always the red light. It's always on. Uh, that's my time. Thank you. Good luck. And I'll see you all when we're dead. Thank you.